Well, good day and welcome back to the shed. This is part three of this AWA Radiola Fisk from 1941, and we've got the chassis working very nicely now. It picks up on all the short wave bands and AM. Uh, I've put the speaker in this baffle behind me here just for safekeeping more than anything. I didn't want it sliding off the bench top or anything. Um, if it landed on your foot, it would hurt. And I had planned to get started on the cabinet this week, but it's not good weather for cabinet work. It's supposed to be spring, uh, but uh, no one told the Weather Bureau that, and it's raining. Apparently it's going to rain for another three days. So I thought I'd get started on the dial mechanism at least, which is uh, screwed into the top of the cabinet. And that needs a bit of work. There's a chain drive that runs a drum arrangement in it, and the dial itself needs a bit of cleaning up and work. So I'll get started on that and just assess what needs to be done with the rest of the cabinet. Before I get started on that dial mechanism, I just thought I'd uh, glue up this lifting veneer in the corner here. I may as well get that out of the way before I get too much into it and it'll save a bit of time later. Just cleaning out any, any muck in there, although it seems to be pretty clean, there doesn't seem to be much in there. So I'll just get some glue into that and uh, clamp it up and let it uh, go overnight. I think a pop stick should be okay for this. Uh, I thought of getting the syringe out but I don't think it would be necessary. It's, uh, this should be okay like this. It does go in a bit deeper than I thought, but I think we should still be okay. Yep, that's looking alright. That'll glue up fine. Uh, just put a bit of tape on it to uh, to protect the surface. Um, I don't want marks in it from the timber. Now this other corner, I'll just start by trimming this to a straight line. And the veneer ends about there. Might have to take it to about there, I think. Yeah, that's about right. So, as usual, I'll just do multiple cuts here. Light cuts so you don't um, damage the veneer. And uh, it comes off surprisingly easily then. Just set this to the right angle so the, the grain will run straight. <coughs> and the new piece will just sit in like that. putting a bit of extra tape here uh, to make sure I get even pressure on the new veneer. This gear setup's probably never been touched. Uh, it's been here since 1941 and um, I think it might take a little bit to remove it. Gee, these are, 
Gee, these are really hard to get off. Might need a bit of brute force here. But we have ways. There you go. These are tough to get off. Some of these are really hard to get off. Uh, well that mechanism certainly fought me all the way. Um, the rest of it's held in by these screws which seem to go right through this Bakelite plate and into the steel mechanism underneath. So I'll have to take these out in order to remove it. This Bakelite fascia looks as if it'll be quite fragile when it's taken out. It looks very thin. And one of the major challenge I th challenges I think will be to replicate this glass here. It's gone quite cloudy. I don't think I can reuse it. I might be able to get some perspex and bend it to the right radius. Uh, I'm not too sure how I'm going to go about that yet, but uh, I'll certainly have a look. Now these screws don't seem to go right through, which surprises me because there were certainly screws coming from the outside of the cabinet into that mechanism. So that's those four. There's two on top here. These little radiola badges, I believe, have been reproduced. You can buy them, although that one might clean up okay. I'm not quite sure what it needs. Whether it's enamel or whether it has some kind of glows over the top. It wouldn't be plastic, I don't think, being 1941. That goes through. Oh, I left that one out too. So this comes off as a separate piece, and this, the die looks quite nice under this, it's, um, yeah, it's plastic of some sort, probably celluloid, and uh, this piece here, yeah, it's um, possibly just under a millimetre thick, maybe three quarters, um, anyway I'll put this aside very carefully before anything happens to it. Well that makes sense, there are um, metal thread screws going through the case underneath the Bakelite trim which no doubt hold the mechanism in. So I should be able to take those out and then just lower the mechanism down and take it out. Now I'll have to support this from underneath I guess as I do it.
and this colour under here will give a good indication of what the original finish was. It has faded a bit, it's considerably darker there. But I should be able to bring it back to something like that. Well it's been a long week and I haven't had a chance to do very much to it. But I have cleaned up this style mechanism. Uh, it was pretty good under all the dust. It does have a little bit of rust on this surface here which was horizontal and I'll probably have to treat that with rust converter and I will put some silver paint on it because I suspect it may have acted as a reflector at least partly to reflect light from the, uh, the globe here up onto the dial just in case I'll do it anyway it won't be seen uh, and I've cleaned and lubricated the dial pointer mechanism it runs on these two shafts along here and it now moves quite freely from end to end sometimes. Hmm. Now it won't do it for the video. It was doing it perfectly before. I'll refit this uh, spindle. I'll put the little bushing around in, in there and put a little bit of grease on it. I'll feed it through and perhaps a little bit more grease. This is lithium grease and I'm told it doesn't um, solidify or gum up. I hope the people that told me are right. I use this for gramophones and um, gramophone motors and that type of thing. At least I did initially. I'm increasingly using it on radio parts. So it's got a little bit of grease on there. The next thing to do is just to put this little C-clip on the uh, end of the shaft here and hopefully these are copper or bronze or something um, and perhaps I should just put a bit of grease on that on the surrounds. I'll wipe off the excess later. <laughs> made a bit of a mess of this. Okay so just put the little C-clip in there it didn't have another washer or anything on it, so I'm putting it back as it came off. There we go. Just wipe off the excess. Well, as much out of curiosity as anything, I've set the dial up um, with the dial lamp from the radio in it, and I've got power on it just to see how it looks and I'd have to say it doesn't look too bad. This waveband indicator here seems quite effective. You can see it well even uh, though it looks a bit dull when the dial isn't illuminated. So on medium wave it indicates the central section of the dial as we turn up to 75 to 200 meters it indicates the lower section, outer section of the dial in 31 to 83 the central section, 31 meters the inner section here and it is marked in red on the dial. 25 meters again that's marked in red on the dial. 19 meters and 13 to 16 meters. So I think that's going to be quite okay as it is. I still have to mount the mechanism in there and arrange the chain drive gear to attach to it but that has to be done after it's fitted to the cabinet. So there's just a couple of little clips and things I need to fit on here to uh, to attach it before I lose them and I'll put this aside until the cabinet's done. One thing I still have to do is brush some rust converter over this bottom plate here so I'll, I'll do that. Leave it overnight and um, let it do its magic and then I will uh, give it a coat of silver paint. As for the other hardware that came off the dial there's the drive shaft for the wave change indicator and I've taken the knob off the end of that. There's the drive shaft for the tuning. Uh, that can go in here. And here's the chain for the uh, tuning indicator. It's got a little dead spider in it there, but uh, I don't think he'll mind. And this is actually uh, copper, as far as I can tell, or brass, um, rather than string. It's pretty strong, so it'll be fine. 
I put the other gear in and the odd screws and whatever that were in the chassis I'll pop them in here with some vinegar and I'll leave that overnight for most of it some of it I might leave in longer depending on uh, how well they clean up another thing I'm going to have to deal with is this uh, magic eye tube it's a 6U5 and when I plugged it in it didn't work at all not a thing out of it I assumed that it was dead uh, these things often are um, and I've been looking online and I found that Carl from Carl's Capacitors has a replacement available it's not exactly the same and it has a different um, base it has an octal base his is a, uh, a VI103 so I was just checking the specs for the VI103 and looking at doing a socket change gee those chooks are noisy this morning I was just checking the uh, the specifications for the VI103 to see if the voltages are going to be correct for it just checking the voltages and I put that to earth there um, First of all, uh, yes we have, I've marked the pins around here because it's rather confusing, it's opposite of course to the diagram because you're looking at the base. Uh, AC volts, we should have 6.3 on the heater, which we do, the other side's grounded, uh, and onto DC volts here, and on the target we have just over 250 volts, 260 volts. Grid, we won't see anything on there unless I put it on a low AC voltage. Cathode, nothing showing on there. And the plate, nothing. We don't have a plate. We don't have plate voltage. Target voltage is there. No plate. So looking at the schematic, and here's the 6U5 here, and it, the plate voltage comes from point Y which I finally found is over here on the B plus rail so it goes from the B plus rail through a resistor to the target and then through another resistor R26 to the plate and um, there's no resistors inside the socket I assumed that they would be but they're not so they must be under the chassis so I'll have a look at uh, what's going on there okay so I've got the chassis upside down again and uh, I've finally located where they are. So here are the two resistors. This is R27, it's a 20K and here's a 1 meg R26. And the 20K measures a nice 20.9K, that's pretty good. Um, the 1 meg is open nothing open I thought I checked that in any case I'll um, I'll replace that I should have a one meg resistor lying around somewhere and here we go just tack him in there I find these AWA tag strips to be really good. They just have a little, I suppose, trough that all the component leads lay in horizontally and you just fill it with solder once they're all there. That's come out again, but it'll be easy to just push him back in. Very easy to deal with very easy to deal with and components don't have to go through holes or anything like that they just sit in the slot all right well let's plug it in and see what we've got now uh, just briefly on dim bulb to make sure i haven't shorted anything no that's all right so what do we want about 500 ac dc sorry and let's see we've got that's the target voltage 650 and plate 531 all right so since we have plate voltage let's just plug in the old um, 
magic eye tube and see if it might work. You never know your luck. Good. So look what the radio is working. Yeah, that's good. You've been, uh, you've been hard on that, and that's, that's uh, I really can't see anything in there. Something. I'll just be trying to concentrate. I think it's probably had it. I'll turn the light off in here. Oh, I can't. It's sun's coming through the skylight. I'll turn this light off. Take this one out. No, I can't see a thing in there. Oh, maybe... I'll try it tonight, but in any case, that's not going to be good enough. So, um, I'm glad I bought that uh, tube from Carl after all. While I was in there, I replaced a couple more resistors that were out of spec. Uh, this one here, and uh, one down there, which you probably can't see. But uh, that's that's all that really needed replacing. Everything else was pretty much in spec. These wire ones are all beautiful. They're all right. The rest of them I've checked, and they're pretty close to spec. So. And the radio is working well, so I think I'll leave well enough alone. Well, the weather's uh, improving now. It's uh, definitely spring in the air. So I've moved the cabinet outside, and I think we'll get started on that. Uh, my wife's washing is still hanging out here. Hopefully I won't be in her way. Um, so let's just have a look at this and see what we're in for. I'm not really sure how I'm going to treat it yet. It's um, possibly a shellac finish. I'll just have to have a closer look at it and decide how we're going to proceed with it. One thing I noticed as I was carrying it out is that where I've glued in this section of veneer, um, this whole sheet of plywood is lifting. So I'll just have to get some glue into that and clamp it up before we go any further. The rest of it looks pretty, pretty good, I think. I could use a syringe, but I don't think I need to in this case. Just get that in there as far as I can and squeezing it down here, that should just use a strip of paper just to move it around a bit to make sure it covers everything but I don't think we're going to have a problem oh it does go along a bit, mm, alright okay I think we'll have to bring the glue all the way up to about here push it in there and work it in with the paper strip yeah I think that should be okay okay The next thing is, I guess, to remove the speaker baffle. And I notice it's held in by these felt pads. It's not screwed into the front of the cabinet at all. I also notice that the top of the baffle, same thing, it's held in with felt pads and it stops short of the shelf that holds the chassis. So this whole thing, I'm not quite sure how it would come out. These wooden blocks are nailed in. So it's not going to... I could take out the nails, I suppose. I hate to take nails out of cabinets, but it might be the only way. I can't slide the panel sideways because it'll hit this block here. I'm thinking removing these bottom blocks might be easier. I can't see any other way of, uh, of getting that out. The top half of the panel that holds a grill cloth appears to just be cardboard and it's stapled in and that sits behind the speaker baffle. Uh, I don't think removing that first will be viable and I don't think it would get us anywhere. So here we go. I think if I uh, prise these out, we should be all right, they're coming. And I'll possibly replace those screws 
those nails with screws when I put it back together. I can't quite get the hammer under there. Whoa. Okay. So that's it. I guess I'll do the same thing on the other side. Now, yep, the whole thing comes out, all with felt strips everywhere. So the whole thing was uh, not wanting to vibrate against the cabinet. This cardboard section does not go all the way down. It ends just beyond the speaker shelf. And the grill cloth is glued directly to the cabinet. Oh dear. That's not going to be easy to replace. Okay, so that's that. And yes, this is just glued in I think. There doesn't seem to be any tacks in it or anything like that. I might be able to keep a piece of it for perhaps another radio. If I can take it off in one piece. So here's the front of it and you can see those um, baffle brackets there or the felt pads that hold the speaker baffle in. The other thing of concern are these two plastic um, panels, so volume and tone. When I first bought this I did post it on Facebook and someone replied saying that these were available. Uh, and for the life of me I can't find the post again and I don't know who it was. So if anyone knows if these little, um, I guess, celluloid panels are have been reproduced or are available, I'd really like to know. The other one is the same, only it says tone. I guess I'll remove them for the time being. I doubt if they'll clean up very well, so I would be probably better off without them rather than to have the, uh, the crappy ones on there. But if I can get reproductions, I'll be very happy. Well, the first thing I want to do before I go any further is give this a wipe over. Just see what kind of finish we have on here and what I'm going to do with it. It's got dust of ages in it, of course. So that front panel is in quite good condition. There's some crazing of the surface. Well the veneer itself overall is in good condition. One of the tricky bits is uh, going to be how to treat these edges. Um, these look as if they've been sprayed with um, tinted lacquer rather than paint and it does give a slightly woody look although there's very little wood grain to be, um, to be seen in them. The finish on the rest of it's crazed and I don't think I can do anything with that, that'll have to come off. I can try and match this colour as well as I can with acrylic paint. I can do reasonably well with that. Along here, there is some graduation of tone from bottom to top. I was thinking perhaps if I put a wood stain underneath and then acrylic over the top and I could possibly rub it back to reveal the wood stain underneath, provided I can get it dark enough to match the colour. That's going to be tricky. I'll just have to um, experiment a bit and see what I can do with it. I need to find out just what kind of finish we have on here too. Just uh, rub it with some methylated spirits and see if it comes off on the cloth. It's probably a shellac finish. If it doesn't it will be um, a lacquer finish of some kind. 
that doesn't seem to be softening. No, nothing's coming off there that's not going sticky at all. So I think this is a, uh, a sprayed lacquer. It does look quite good when it's wet, it's just uh, not going to stay that way. So looking at this cabinet, uh, parts of it are very good, but the surface on this um, veneer is crazed. Uh, in fact, it's crazed right through it. And being a lacquer finish, I don't think there's any chance of recovering that to look reasonable. As for these um, brown trim bits, I can probably replicate that all right. These ones here are almost perfect. I might try and keep them and just match, use them as a reference to match the colour of the others. Um, this surface is crazed over its whole area and there's nothing much I can do to recover that and that will just have to come off. And the same with these down here. Anyway, the first job is going to be to remove all this dust and crud from the inside because I don't want it falling all over the, uh, the finish when I've got it uh, wet if I'm moving it around. And uh, I'd like to get rid of it anyway. So I thought I'd turn it on its side and uh, do the side for a start. Uh, at least it's an easy flat surface to strip and I'll get an idea of how the, uh, this surface reacts to the paint stripper. I wasn't able to get the septone stripper I used uh, before and uh, so I've got this KBS coatings. It's an automotive stripper. It should hopefully be much the same thing as the septone um, because it worked very well. So I'll just brush some of this on. Um, I'm not sure how long the reaction time will be. So I'll keep an eye on it and take it off um, as soon as it starts to bubble. It says open with care, so I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, oh yeah, you just pull the nozzle out by the looks of it, like that. And Uh, and there's a ring pull in the end. Whoa, that had a bit of pressure in it. That must be why you open it with care. Okay, I'm going to wash this off my hands now. All right, here goes. I've got a um, tub with some water and a damp cloth in case I splash any of it on myself. And I'll just tip a bit onto the side and brush it out, I guess. Now that's not a very thick coat. I'll just keep an eye out for it bubbling up. A little bit more down here. All right, I'll keep an eye on that for a few minutes and just see how long it takes uh, to bubble up or soften. Okay, well you won't see me wearing gloves very often, but I'm going to for this. Um, and I'll just see if this is softened enough. It is coming off, but it's pretty dry. I think I should have put on a thicker coat. This of course is the depressing stage of the uh, cabinet restoration because it's going to look dreadful until it's finished. Okay, I've got the second coat on and I haven't given it a chance to dry out like the other one. I suspect it will just um, come off like that, yep. That's a pretty good result, I think. That'll sand up nicely. Now 
This cabinet does have some quite nice grain in it. Hopefully we'll be able to bring that out in the uh, final finish. I probably won't put any stain on this. Just bring out the natural timber colour. All right, I think that'll sand out nicely. I'll let it dry for a few minutes and see how it looks. Well, that's dried off very nicely. A light sand and uh, that's all that'll be needed, I think. It, uh, it's in good condition. So I'll turn it over and do the other side. Well, that's the second side done and it's come up quite well, similar to the other side, so that's good. Uh, I did notice a problem with the top panel though while I was doing this. It's lifting off and it seems to be lifting a little bit on the other side. I decided I'd better stick this down before I go any further. So I've got the syringe out. Just use some um, PVA adhesive. And suck some of that up. Okay. that off. Should hold it alright. Go on, off you go. <laughs> I was thinking while I'm waiting for this glue to dry I could probably strip these front panels. Uh, I won't be able to do the central one because I need to move this wood, but these uh, should come up all right. So I'll get on with that. I'm running out of time this weekend, so I want to get as much done as I can. Just try tipping some onto this filler blade. That should do. I don't particularly want to strip these brown parts. I'll probably rub them down. I may repaint them, but I really don't want to necessarily strip them to bare timber. All right, we'll let that uh, work its magic for a minute. All right, let's just see how this comes off. Mm, not very well. No. Okay, it's the next weekend and I've finished all the stripping. It, um, it's taken most of it off. The rest uh, I'll have to rely on sandpaper to get out. I've decided not to strip this central section because the original finish is in pretty nice condition. 
and uh, just a rub with fine emery paper and um, a refinish I think will be fine for that I don't think it needs anything more as for the rest of it I'd, uh, I've got a lot of sanding ahead of me so I'll get into that well that's the top pretty much done I uh, had to resort to um, 120 grit paper to start with to get the residue off of the uh, stripper uh, there's a little dent there that I'm going to have to deal with and you might notice in the back corner here is the repair that I did the timber looks a little darker than the surrounding I hope I can blend that in uh, it shouldn't be too noticeable though all this trim will take a lot of sanding I didn't strip it entirely all that's required because it's going to have an opaque finish on it all that's required is a good flat surface but I still need to get it smooth and uh, suitable to uh, to have the finish put on it. So there's quite a lot of sanding in this. It's a fairly complex moulding. It's been quite an effort just to get to the top to, to this stage. Um, there's a lot of sanding involved and quite a lot of work. So this is going to take some time. I'm not going to fit it in this video. So the sensible thing is to call this the end of uh, this video and um, we'll come back in part four, I think it will be, um, and hopefully we'll get it all finished back together and working. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like what I'm doing, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, I'm nearly there with a thousand subscribers, 900 and something. Um, and I hope you can join me in the shed or even outside here for the next video when we'll get this all finished.